Good evening y bienvenidos a su Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Alex Hernandez of Noticias Univision Chicago, which airs every weekday morning at 5 and 6. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. For the first time in 54 years, the 14th Ward is getting new leadership in City Council. We talk with older person elect Heilu Gutierrez. Half of the vendors inside the discount mall in Little Village are being forced out. We tell you why. Households in Illinois receiving SNAP food benefits will see them decrease this month. Applications are open for a scholarship aimed at helping immigrant and Latino students pay for college. Birria is not only something we do for a living, it's actually embedded in our DNA. And a century-old family recipe from Mexico that's perfect for winter days in Chicago. All that coming up, but our first story tonight. Meet one of the new faces headed to city council. That's right after this. Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by the support of these donors. Though the race for mayor and many of the aldermanic races are still up in the air, this week's municipal election did bring some decisive outcomes. Among the outright victors winning seats for the first time were Julia Ramirez in the 12th Ward and Jesse Fuentes in the 26th Ward. Here is some of what they had to say to parachutes the day after the election. I think it's deeply rooted in the ways in which we don't have opportunities and some of our uh, Chicago public schools in 2025 may close and so how are, how are we providing opportunity for kids to prosper to, for people to thrive and I want to make sure that um, that we're investing in working class families in the 12th Ward. There is a direct correlation from the disinvestment in our schools and youth programming across the 26th Ward and the increase in crime in Belmont Craig and El Mosa Logan Square and Humboldt Park. Our priorities are going to be to ensure that we are opening up mental health clinics, that we are investing in youth programming, and that we fight for schools to have the resources. And joining us now is uh, one of their new colleagues and another new face to city council, Heilu Gutierrez, older person elect for the 14th Ward, which includes parts of Archer Heights and Gage Park. She's the first new older person in that ward in more than five decades and that's saying a lot thank you for joining me uh, today and I wanted to ask if you agree with your colleagues on how they would approach improving public safety you know we need to tackle this issue from the roots right I'm a former educator and mama too we need to ensure that every single community in our ward is safe but we also need to make sure that our police officers and our CPD is well equipped and they're also being taken care of. You know, there are also parents and neighbors that they need to go back to their families. So we need to work together with my colleagues, all other city officials, as well as uh, the county and other state and federal officials, you know, for us to bring resources to our 14 ward. What made you decide to run for uh, office? So I, I'm a former educator, as I said, mama too, and I've been um, a district director in Cook County for four years with Commissioner Anaya. And oftentimes, I've seen the disparities and the inequities uh, in, their, in our ward. Even though, as soon as I came to Chicago, I saw how different Brighton Park, where I landed, was than other, uh, other uh, communities in the north side or the suburbs. And I always uh, thought about why was, what, what was the issue? Why were they making that difference? And then I started to get involved volunteering, and I realized that it because of that leadership that we had in the 14th Ward. What do you think is uh, the biggest need that you see in the 14th ward and how do you plan to address it so we need to revive that office right oftentimes at the doors because we knocked on so many doors our neighbors were all always telling us they're picking and choosing who to serve right there's streets that are cleaner that are paved but some others are neglected and forgotten but overall the district the ward is like that so we just need to ensure that every single request is taken care of in a timely manner and always with a happy face with our staff and with an alderman that is able to talk and listen to the needs of our ward. You were endorsed by Jesus Chuy Garcia, mm -hmm. and as we know, he did not make the runoff. Um, have you made up your mind or on who you're backing uh, in the race between Paul Vallas and Brandon Johnson? You know, endorsements are not given. They need to be um, earned. So I need to make sure that my 14 ward is going to be well taken care of and whatever it's either one or the other, I need to check exactly what their policies and what their intentions are with our ward because we need to make sure that we back up the best option for our 14 ward. 
And this word, you, as you know, obviously has a long history under its former alder person, alderman at Burke. Uh, are there things you plan to do differently? As I said, serving every single resident the same way. You know, paving the streets, cleaning the streets, bringing resources. We don't have a, a nice library in Gage Park. We don't have a community center. We need to make sure that all our kids, residents, and youth have great spaces to thrive. But also, we need to bring investment and help our businesses to keep growing and welcome any new um, neighbors and business owners to our 14 ward. Right. Are you looking forward to working with, uh, you know, new older people? I am ready, you mm -hmm. know. I'm a, a community leader and I've always worked as a team leader and a team uh, player and I'm ready to work with them alongside with the new mayor as well. Definitely. Well, congratulations thank again. You. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for the invitation. Back with more Chicago Tonight Latino Voices right after this. Now to Joanna Hernandez and long-standing vendors closing shop in Little Village. Joanna? Alex, half the vendors at the Disco Mon Little Village are being forced out. For the last two years, the mall has been in the middle of a battle between the property owner, Novak Development, and its vendors. Here's the latest on this ongoing saga. It might be the end of an era for the discount mall. Nine, ten. That's because half of the mall's vendors have until the end of the month to pack up and leave. Safra so Sati is one of those vendors closing shop. No, I'm ready to go. We don't have any choice, so if we don't have choice, so we, we have to leave. They, they give us notice, you know, you have to go. But you never wanted to leave? No, of course, we have to stay. After more than 30 years, Sati is one of 67 vendors who received a letter explaining they have until March 26 to sell their merchandise. I'm going to end here. That's it. I'm going to retire. I'm going to go uh, like maybe four or five months in Pakistan. Then I come back. I will see. The building operated by two separate companies, Pilsen Plaza Corporation and PK Mall. The owner of the Pilsen Plaza Corporation recently signed a contract with Novak Development Corporation. The new lease runs for 10 years with three five-year options for a potential total of 25 years. As for the other side, Marta Torres, the manager of PK Mall, says the owner, Imad Kim, couldn't come to an agreement with Novak. We were trying to do what was right for the vendors as well as the management. Uh, when they didn't agree to, our, to the, the owner's offer, um, we had no choice but to decide to leave. The Disco Mall is known to offer below market rentals and short term agreements with little to no credit history. Torres says the contract Novak was offering the owner was not sustainable for its vendors. Very high, and, and we, were, uh, we know that my vendors, uh, they were going to have a hard time, especially nowadays when we're living in a recession. There are still questions about what the contract looks like for the disco mall operator who renewed his lease with Novak. Torres says there have been talks about the Pilsen Plaza Corporation moving to their side. The others I sign. Um, they're going to come to our side, and this place is not big enough to accommodate all the vendors. And it's up to him to see if uh, he's going to be able to keep some of them. Juan Serate and his daughter are one of the vendors hoping to stay. They've been operating their pet store inside the disco mall since 1989. In February, Alderman Byron Cicho Lopez sat down with Novak's team alongside city officials to discuss the plan for the plaza. We discussed at late, you know, there's enough room here to accommodate everybody. They, are, they acknowledge that, but yet they said, sorry, we already signed a contract. They can re Contracts are changed all the time. So I, I wasn't born yesterday. This newly released rendering shows what the Little Village Plaza is expected to look like after renovations. 
Novak says it plans on repairing the front of the Disco Mall, which includes the roof, the plaza parking lot with an underground storm water system, among other improvements. This Disco Mall belongs to Mr. Kim. My name belongs to him. So actually, this Mall is not staying. This Mall is the one that's leaving. Torres has been a manager for PK Mall for the last 30 years and says it's going to be hard to end such a big chapter of her life. I hope we we're going to be able to open another discount mall in the future. As for a name change for the Disco Mall, a Novak spokesperson says it's between the two mall operators. We did ask about plans for the side that's leaving, and we're told the space will be leased to the discount operator who renewed his contract. No word on who or what will replace the empty side. Renovations are expected to start in the spring. Alex, back to you. Thank you, Joanna. And now it's time for high school seniors and college students to pay attention. Applications are now open for the Miller Pettis Family Scholarship. The scholarship is provided by the nonprofit Latinos Progresando, and it offers financial support to Latinos and immigrants pursuing or already enrolled in college. The scholarship honors Angela Perez Miller, an educator and advocate for bilingual education in Chicago, and her son, Diane Dion, who has uh, deeply involved in his community of Marshall Square. This year, we are very excited because we will be um, distributing five $2,000 scholarships to five students um, in Cook County. Um, so the criteria for students to apply, um, you must be admitted or enrolled in undergraduate seeking degree um, or a certificate program at a US accredited um, college or university. Um, the students must be of Latino or immigrant background. Um, they can also be undocumented students. Um, they must be obviously seeking academic achievement. They must have some involvement in the community, um, demonstrate commitment to community service. The students that are applying must also reside in Cook County. Latinos Progresando hopes that this scholarship opportunity will allow students to continue and further their education. Um, and our hope is also that with that commitment to community service, that they will you know, give back to their community. We were actually just in touch with one of our recipients from, 20, from the class of 2020. Um, he's currently a student at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, hoping to graduate in May of next, May 2024. And um, it was really nice to hear from him and hear you know, how far he's been able to go since the last time we spoke to him. And so it's always really nice, you know, for us to hear those stories from those students that are, you know, still enrolled in school, st still pursuing a higher education and just super excited and happy to, you know, come back and give back to the community that, you know, once supported them. Actually, applications for the Miller Pettis Scholarship close on April 10th. You'll find more on how to apply on our website. Back with more Chicago Tonight Latino Voices right after this. Households in Illinois receiving SNAP food benefits will see them decrease this month. A pandemic era policy giving low income families additional SNAP benefits has come to an end, leaving many Latino households bracing for impact as inflation remains high. According to data from the Greater Chicago Food Depository, nearly 100,000 households in predominantly Latino neighborhoods participated in SNAP food uh, each month in 2022 fiscal year. And the average person will receive about $90 less in SNAP benefits per month. Joining us now with more are Dr. Evelyn Figueroa, Director of the Pilsen Food Pantry, and Claudia Rodriguez Roman, Director of Public Benefits Outreach at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. I want to welcome both for joining us today. But I want to start with you, Claudia. Thank you for being here. Can you tell us a little bit more about these additional uh, SNAP benefits and why they are coming to an end? Sure. So the federal government decided in April 2020 that they were going to uh, give SNAP households additional benefits uh, to help with everything that was happening with the pandemic and to ensure that people uh, did not become food insecure. So people have been receiving these additional SNAP benefits for almost three years now. 
And due to a decision made by Congress, uh, they ended in February, which means that starting in March, um, SNAP households will see their benefits decrease, which we're very concerned about, especially as you mentioned, because right now inflation is high and, and many uh, food prices are very high. What are you uh, hearing now? What are you uh, hearing from communities, especially Latino communities, now that they won't be receiving the additional food benefits? Yeah, we're hearing from people who call our hotline and that we see out in the community that they're really concerned. Um, these are people that are already struggling to put, put food on the table and they're concerned about how they're going to be able to afford uh, food now. But we want to make sure that they know that there are resources available even for people that, um, you know, if they're concerned about their immigration status, they can turn to a pantry or even apply for other food nutrition programs that they may be eligible for. Dr. Figueroa, what kind of impact do you think this will have on um, the people you serve at the Pilsen Pantry? Oh, hi, good afternoon. Um, the impact is going to be enormous. Um, remember that Latinos um, and Black people are twice as likely to experience food insecurity. The rates in Chicago are much higher than the general population. So this is a this is a population that chronically struggles with it, and an average reduction of ninety dollars per person um, for our average household at the Pilsen Food Pantry is is over three people. So you can imagine that that's you know that's a week a week or a week and a half of groceries that people aren't going to be able to make. They're very worried and um, they're going to have to find more pantries. The, historically, this part of um, Pilsen doesn't have a lot of food pantries. We're one of four food pantries um, in Pilsen and most food pantries are not open every day. So it's very right. restrictive. So you are anticipating more demand? Absolutely. Our numbers uh, went up uh, during COVID and every time we've increased capacity, we've, in we've continued to have more clients. Pre-COVID, we were about 160 to 180 clients a week. Um, our average census now is 410 clients. Will you be able to meet that demand? I'm not sure. Uh, Greater Chicago Food Depository is definitely doing a lot of outreach to help us um, stretch our dollars as much as we can. Uh, Greater Chicago Food Deposit is very generous with us. There are some individuals that make individual donations that help us uh, quite a bit. Um, and we're going to have to increase the amount of grocery store rescue that we do, which is um, is uh, quite tedious and labor intensive, but that we just don't want to cut anyone off. Definitely. Claudia, uh, to pivot a little bit, um, how has your organization actually responded in supporting migrants who have arrived here from Texas? Sure. So, you know, the Food Depository as an organization and our partners believe that everyone has a right. Uh, it's a human basic right to receive food. So regardless of where you come from, your immigration status, if you live in Cook County in Chicago, we will provide food. And we have been working very closely with the city and state uh, to be able to provide boxes of shelf stable items, produce and diapers also to individuals and family uh, families who need it. And we'll continue responding to the need um, as we have been, you know, for many years now. And thanks to uh, the generous support of our of our donors. Dr. Figueroa, pretty much the same question. Uh, has the additional population affected uh, your supplies as well? Yes, our average uh, weekly census has increased by about 30 to 40 households since um, since September. We also run a free clothing program, so we've taken up specific collections to help uh, families in need. These are folks that are coming without uh, winter gear, without baby gear, really with the uh, flip-flops on their feet, and that's all that they have. So collecting suitcases and just other things that we don't normally stock um, or that we don't stock in very high volume has been quite a challenge, but we've received a lot of support from Alderman Cito Lopez and, uh, and other community partners. Right. Well, definitely, uh, a lot of people will need uh, help, right, and would want to help as well. Uh, Claudia Rodriguez, can you tell us where they can find more information on how to help or, or get help? Sure. They can go to our website, chicagosfoodbank.org. They can find information about how to volunteer, donate, but also if they need assistance, whether it's applying for public benefits or to find their local food pantry. Um, we also have a website in Spanish, is Banco de Alimentos Chicago.org, um, and they can find information in Spanish there as well. 
Could you repeat that, uh, those websites for us one last time, please? Sure. It's uh, chicagosfoodbank.org, and the Spanish website is bancodealimentoschicago.org. I want to thank you both for your time. Thank you for Dr. Evelyn Figueroa and Claudia Rodriguez Roman for joining us today. Thank you. Good to see you. And up next, cooking up a century old family recipe. seven culinary regions in Mexico, each with their own unique foods, techniques, and flavors that have evolved over the centuries. In a classic tale of Mexican ingenuity, the chili braised stew birria was created as a way to take advantage of an overpopulation of goats in the Jalisco region. Fifty years ago, a Jalisciense named Ramon Reyes brought his family's century-old birria recipe to Chicago's southeast side. Now his son is bringing the traditional dish to a new generation. Producer Erika Gunderson stews on this story. Birria is not only something we do for a living, it's actually embedded in our DNA. I like to believe so. When Andy Reyes rhapsodizes about the perfect bowl of birria, he has four generations of his forebears speaking through him. I have to have a piece of costilla, the rib, with a little bit of fat and a little bit of meat towards the end. Drenched a little bit in consomme with onion and cilantro. First you put the lime, then you get the tortilla, you put the meat, put some salsa, and then you take a bite out of it. That is for me, Vivia. Though Andy is only the second generation of Reyes's to run Viriaria Ocatlan, the family's Viria recipe goes back to 1926, when his great-grandfather developed his own version of the stewed goat recipe in Ocatlan, Jalisco. When Andy's father, Ramon Reyes, immigrated to the Chicago area, he brought the birria know-how with him. His uncle was here in Chicago, and at 18, my dad received this postcard. And it was one of those old-school postcards where it said Chicago and it had the skyline. He pulls out the postcard and points out to his friends and says, hey guys, look, it's my uncle from, he lives in Chicago now. And one day, I'm gonna sell birria right here. In 1973, Ramon Reyes made good on that prediction. He took over a small diner at 87th and Commercial and began selling the family specialty. A second location on 106th Street was added in 1992. Over the years, all four of Ramon and Linda Reyes's children worked at the family restaurants. I remember making uh, like my debut officially, like when I was eight years old, and he'd sit me down in the corner and I'd be a chubby little kid eating my taco, you know? I started working here literally in high school. I remember I used to play football and I would have practice on Saturdays after practice when all my friends would go hang out, I'd come here. When Ramon stepped away from the business for health reasons five years ago, Andy, the youngest child, stepped in. I wasn't ready, but luckily I have my sisters. That's the beautiful thing about having a family business. You won't be alone. Since then, Andy has helped steer the restaurant through COVID by bringing some modern marketing to the traditional dish and updating the menu to include trendy quesabiria tacos. We kept everyone on payroll, but we closed for like a month and a half. So what did I do? I got back on social media. ¿Qué pasó? ¿Qué le doy? And because of social media, I got traction. Ooh, ooh. Andy says he feels a responsibility to his family and the community that sustained them to keep Birria Ocotlan thriving. I think the love and the heart that my father put initially into this business, the relationships he's able to build with the community, and I think the recipe itself speaks volumes. We do put a lot of heart and soul into our food. We've been doing this for, man, close to 100 years now in my family. I've seen four or five generations come in through the door, and that's very special. 
If it wasn't for the community, we wouldn't be where we're at. Food is supposed to bring people together. It unites people from all different walks of life, from every culture. So beef is, is for everybody. For Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, this is Erica Gunderson. That looks amazing. Well, that's going to be our show for this weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. For all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, I'm Alex Hernandez. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy, stay safe. Muy buenas noches. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that's proud to serve its community through pro bono legal services.